today's episode, and I have a very special guest on today's podcast. Today, I interview an Emmy Award-winning keynote speaker, musician, comedian, leading authority on employee engagement and workplace culture, and author of the new book, I Love It Here, How Great Leaders Create Organizations Their People Never Want to Leave, released nationally on April 13th. Welcome to the Winner Circle, Clint Pulver. What's up, Derek? It's good to be here, man. I appreciate you having me on the show. Right on. Um, To get started, there's a lot of chaos in the world right now, and I want to set the tone for this podcast. And this podcast is meant to uplift, inspire, and empower. Very positive. So let's start with a really positive question. What do you love right now about your world, Clint Pulver? Uh, Right now, hands down, would be my family. Uh, Obviously, my wife, we just had uh, two cute little babies. Uh, So I've got two little, little girls, and they are totally my world. We're, we're in full uh, book launch mode right now. So that's a little chaotic. But man, they're, they're my, they're my everything, everything. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. So you So you mentioned you're in book launch right now. So yeah, let's just describe what your general day looks like. What's the life in the day of Clint Pulver look this past month? Yeah, so right now uh, I'm doing anywhere from five to seven podcasts a day. Uh, We're doing uh, media interviews. We're doing, um, we're sending out a ton of books, press kits, a lot of emails, uh, and just trying to promote the book, trying to spread the message. It's been almost five years of my life writing this book. We have put in a ton of research. And so, yeah, that's how the morning starts off is usually I've got a podcast and uh, we, we work our way through the schedule and uh, I'm traveling. I go to uh, Chicago tomorrow and speak at three different locations. And then I'm home for uh, two more days and then I'm back on the road uh, speaking and doing more podcasts. And yeah, it's, a, it's fairly chaotic uh, up until April 13th for us. Mm-hmm. So let's get into your call to adventure to write this book. Where did that inspiration come from? What is the origin of this book being written? Yeah, it's a great question. So five years ago, I was in a mastermind group in New York City. And we went out with other executives and CEOs, and we're learning from other CEOs about how they would run a business, what worked, what didn't work, uh, how they built these companies. And one of the gentlemen that we met with owned a sporting good chain retail store in New York City, in Manhattan. And he talked about how his business needed to change and adapt to meet the demands of the market. But then I asked him about his management style. And I said, so the way you manage today, have you changed versus what you did 20 years ago. And he fired back and he said, no, the way I manage today is the same way I managed 20 years ago and we get results. And I really found it interesting, Derek, that he felt the need to change how he moved and operated his business, but he didn't feel the need to change how he worked with people. And we're in his store and I looked around and everybody in the store was my age or younger. And I thought to myself, I wonder if they would say the same thing. I wonder if they would have the same perception that the CEO does, that everything's wonderful and great and we're building this wonderful organization. So I thank the gentleman for his time. We had 35 minutes to kill until we had to be to the next place. I had nothing else better to do. So I walked up to the first employee and I looked like this. I had a backwards hat on, t-shirt, my Nikes. And I walked up and I said, hey, I'm just curious. What's it like to work here? And the employee got really quiet, looked around. It felt like we were doing an illegal drug exchange. And the employee said, do you really want to know? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, I can't stand it here. Like, it literally is just a job. I'm a number. Everybody, all the employees, we're all numbers. I don't even think my manager knows I'm here today. And I said, okay, well, then why are you still working here? And he said, I've already applied to three other places. As soon as I get an opportunity, I'm out. And I thought, okay, well, maybe the the kid's having a bad day, right? So I went and asked another employee and another and another. And at the end of those conversations, I I interviewed six of his employees. And at the end of those six conversations, five out of the six of his employees said they would not be working for him and this guy's store in less than three and a half months. And it was so interesting 
to, to see the difference between what leadership thought versus what the reality was. And I kept thinking to myself, what if the CEO could hear this? What if he actually knew? And that was the moment, that was the day that I started the Undercover Millennial Program. It's kind of like Undercover Boss without the makeup. I am a millennial. And over the course of five years since that moment started, I've worked with 181 organizations and I have interviewed over 10,000 employees undercover. And the magic of the research, when I would go into an organization looking for a job, uh, it wasn't when an employee was dissatisfied with their job. The magic was when I would go up to an employee and say, hey, I'm just looking for work. You know, would you recommend it? You know, what's it like to work here? And they would respond with, I love it here. I love my job. Oh my gosh, I love what we're doing. Like the culture, my manager, Susie, you got to meet Susie. And, and then when that would trend in an organization and the next employee and the next employee and the next employee would all say, I love it here. And that was always so significant to see what the leaders were doing in those organizations to create cultures, businesses, workplaces that people never wanted to leave. And uh, that's what the book is about. And I decided to title the book, I Love It Here, How Great Leaders Create Organizations Their People Never Want to Leave. And it is based off of the five years of research as the undercover millennial going in and finding the truth, the most real and authentic data behind how people weren't just surviving at work, but they were actually thriving. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the commonalities amongst the people that told you, I love it here? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a great question. Leadership, hands down leadership. Leadership is the number one reason why people stay in an organization. It's also the number one reason why people leave an organization. And we've all had right those, those really great bosses. And then you've had the miserable bosses. And when an employee would say, I love it here. I love my job. I love my manager. They never really, you know, referred to them as a manager. Usually when an employee hated their job, they hated the manager. But when they loved their job, they loved the mentor. I call it mentorship versus management. Mentorship is not leadership. Mentorship is not management. It's its own entity. Mentorship cannot be a title. It can't be given. Like you can't like just give someone a title and say, you're the mentor. It doesn't work that way. Mentorship must be earned. And if you look at any great story in, in, in life and what really makes a story come together, it's, it's mentorship. It really is. Like you have the hero of the story and they go through a difficult time, something they're trying to overcome. And then who always appears in the story? The mentor. Every time. Like Luke Skywalker had Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? Uh, Katniss Everdeen, she had Hamish. Frodo, I love, I love Lord of the Rings. Frodo had Gandalf. Uh, yeah, the Aladdin had the genie. Rocky, Rocky had Mick. These and great Clint, mentors. And yeah, Clay Culver, who did he have? Yeah, and I, and I had a, a man by the name of Mr. Jensen. I've had a lot of mentors. You never forget the good ones ever. And it was because of who the mentors were that gave the hero the reason to connect with them. Mm -hmm. And. And it was powerful, Derek. It was so, when that, when that happened, when that took place, when a manager took on the role of a mentor, loyalty increased, engagement went up, performance went up because that mentor got to the part about them. Every employee is always asking every employer, let me know when it gets to the part about me. And some people hear that and they say, well, those entitled little sh shining stars in my life, right? Like, let me know when it gets to the part about me. And it's not so much about entitlement as it is about good business. It's bringing humanity back into the, the workplace. And it was a beautiful thing to see. Mm -hmm. So I want to get a bit more into the book later on. But first, let's get to know you. We heard about the origin story of the book. Um, let's hear about the origin story of Cliff, of Clint Pulver, however, you wish, how, however far back you find it relevant to go back. So in school, I was the kid, the young, the young person that had a hard time sitting still. I struggle with that. I still struggle with that. 
and it would sit in class and, and my right hand would start to tap and then my left hand would start to move. And I would just hit, hit things. I would just tap. It, it, it helped me focus, but everybody else saw it as a problem. I got nicknamed the twitcher. A lot of people called me the tapper. I got sent to the principal's office and he told me to sit on my hands. And that worked for about five seconds because then my feet would start tapping. It happened again and again until one day there was a teacher and his name was Mr. Jensen. And he looked at me in class and he said, young man, he said, yeah, you in, in the back. He said, come here, come here. Uh, I need to see you after class. We're going to have a conversation. And everybody else in the class is like, oh man, Twitcher's going to die. <laughs> like, this is it. The bell rings, class dismissed, everybody leaves except for me and Mr. Jensen. And he pulls me up and he says, listen, I've been watching you. I watch you. you uh, it's, uh, you're on the list. You're the kid that's on the list. Everybody knows about you. You're the kid that constantly has a hard time sitting still. You tap in my class and you tap in everybody else's class. He said, but I, I, it's crazy. I'll watch you and you'll start writing with your right hand while you tap with your left hand. And then you can switch it. You switch the pen and you'll start writing with your left hand and you'll start tapping with your right hand. And he said, I, I think you're ambidextrous. And I was like, no, I'm Presbyterian. He said, no, that's not what it means. That's not what it means. He said, can you tap your head and rub your belly? And I gave it a go and I could do it. He said, can you switch it? He said, can you rub your head and then tap your belly? And literally without thinking about it, I could do it. Mr. Jensen, he, uh, he leaned back in his chair and he smiled and he said, I, I don't think you're a problem. I just think you're a drummer. I'm somebody that believes in the power of moments. Like we, as, as, as people, we don't remember days, we remember moments. And in that moment, Mr. Jensen, that old teacher, he leaned back in his desk and he opened up the top drawer and he reached inside and he took out my very first pair of drumsticks my very first pair and there was a caveat and he put them in my hands and he said, listen, I'm going to give these to you. And I just want you to keep them in your hands as much as you can. And let's see what happens. That was 22 years ago. And for 22 years, I have had the opportunity to tour and record all over the world as a professional drummer. I've been on America's Got Talent. I've toured and recorded with the Blue Man Group, uh, Carrie Underwood. I played with Tim McGraw. I, I graduated high school and I had no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life. So what do you do when you graduate and you have no clue? You go to college, right? And you go to university. <laughs> and so I went to school and I graduated in 2012 with a bachelor's degree and zero college debt. Zero. And that was from music scholarships. And I don't say all those things to go, oh, wow, good for you, Clint, or what a list of accolades, bravo. You know, the reason I, I tell you that is because of one person. One person who, as, as a young child, decided to advocate for me. One person who saw an opportunity, not a problem, and created a moment that helped me live a better story. Beautiful. So... So far, it seems like everything has come very easy for you with like in terms of like everything really. Um, but an example is like the ambidextrous. Um, Mr. Jensen asked you tap your head, rub your belly. Yep, I could do that. Can you rub your belly? Can you, uh, can you rub your head and tap your belly? Yep, I could do that. Um, pick up these drums. I could do that. So let's talk about somewhere where you didn't feel, and maybe it was the drumming, where you didn't feel that I could do that and you felt resistance stopping you from moving forward and how did you overcome that yeah i wanted to always fly as a young person drumming was not like the thing i grew up necessarily wanting to do full time i wanted to fly like mm -hmm. I, I was a kid that had every helicopter and airplane that you could buy at the toy store hanging from my ceiling i just loved it and i graduated high school and i i was able to graduate from flight school with my pilot's license. It's pretty cool. And I went and did a study abroad for two years and I came home and I had to renew my driver's license. 
we've all had this glorious experience, right? Going to renew your driver's license at the DMV or wherever it is. Like, and I had to wait forever. It was like Disneyland in the summertime. And I walked up to the lady, I handed her my paperwork and she started looking through everything. And then she said, now put your head in the, in the, in the box. Now you've done this before, Derek, right? It's a vision test. You go over and you put your head in this little black box, screen goes white and you just read off the letters. And I put my head in the box and screen went white, but all I could see was six black dots. And I looked at her and I said, I, I think uh, the machine's broken. Uh, I, it's, it's glitching out. All I can see is six black dots. She said, you got to push harder. Okay. So I go over, click, still see the same thing. And I said, can I go to another machine? I think it's broken. And she's like, listen, I've been here for seven and a half hours today. I've seen 47 people and they've all put their head in the box and read the letters, read the letters. I go back the third time, same thing. She comes from around the counter. She pushes me out of the way and she puts her head in the box and she reads out loud C-K-G-E-L-F-W-Z-Y-N verbatim. And then she looked at me and she said, can you read? <laughs> and I said, yes. I said, lady, yes, I can read. And then she said, and then I think you're blind. And I looked at her and we're having this conversation. And I said, listen, lady, I see you right now. <laughs> I said, I drove here today. And then she got really serious and she said, well, you're not driving back. And she grabbed a stamp and I'll never forget. It was another moment. And she pushed it and in red, uh, it, it read, failed. Failed, I failed the driving test, denied driving privileges because I, I, I didn't pass the vision test. I was under house arrest at the, at the DMV. <laughs> I had to call my mother and I said, mom, I, I can't leave. They're not letting me leave. She came and picked me up. Long story short, I ended up at the Moran Eye Center at the University of Utah with one of the top leading authorities in a rare and degenerative eye disease known as keratoconus. And as a young 21 year old kid, I had it really bad, like really bad. My eyes were as bad as an 87 year olds. And I sat there that day in that white room with that doctor in that clinic. And he asked the question that so many young people get asked. And it was, it was, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to fly. Like nobody wants to fly more than me. And he got really serious and he said, listen, he said, Clint, you, you are going, you're going blind. Do you understand that? I was 21. And he said, by the age of 30, 31, gave me 10 years. He said, you'll, you'll lose your sight. You'll be completely blind. Um, That's a hard day. Because there I was as someone who had my eye on the sky. And then I watched in a moment as the sky fell in all around me. And I went from having direction, purpose. I was achieving things. Life was great to literally having nothing. It really was my life. It was everything that I wanted to do. And that was taken away. But I looked back, I looked back at that experience and, you know, and that was really hard. I, I'm, uh, my whole life, has been different and has become a different story because of that failure, because of that difficulty. I never would have gone to college ever because that was not in the books. I was just going to go to flight school and be a helicopter pilot. Uh, I would have never have done what I did in music and drumming. Um, I wouldn't be a speaker. I wouldn't have been an author. I wouldn't have started the undercover millennial program. I wouldn't have met my wife because I met my wife because I was in a movie uh, and that happened because I wasn't flying helicopters. Like, like I learned very quickly that sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fit together. Mm -hmm. And uh, six years ago, I got the phone call from the Moran Eye Center and they they told me to say, Clint, we, we've just started the first human trial of a procedure called cross-linking. And it is for people that have your eye disease. And we're only doing 600 people for the first human study. 
It's not FDA approved. This is completely experimental, but we feel like it will stop the progression of your eye disease. I was number 43 and they flew me back to California and they did the procedure on my right eye. And then six months later, they did the procedure on my left eye and it 100% stopped the progression of my eye disease and saved my sight. I'm barely legal to drive right now. I barely mm. have hard, rigid, gas permeable lenses. A lot of the damage had been done, but at least I'm not blind. Mm -hmm. And again, sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fit together. And uh, that was definitely one of those stories for me. So how did that wisdom come to you that sometimes things happen and then other doors open? Um, how did that knowledge and that wisdom come to you? And what did that coming to you look like? It took time. I think sometimes time needs time. And we sometimes expect or, or hope for things to get fixed very quickly. And that didn't happen. It was years of searching, years of, of not having purpose. It was years of frustration. It was years of bitterness. For sure, it was hard, but time needs time. And my mom told me something very important that I've always remembered in my life. And she said, Clint, no matter how hard or how difficult your life is, in that moment, eventually it will get better. It always gets better. Eventually, the sun's going to rise. No matter how dark it is, the sun's going to rise tomorrow. It always gets better. And I, and that might seem cliche or, or motivational or fluffy, but I, I truly believe that because I have looked at some of the darkest, hardest, most trying times of my life. And eventually, it has gotten better. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I, fi I found my smile. And it was, it was time and the hope of good things to come. And realizing that I still held the pen to write my story. Mm -hmm. And we have that opportunity. We have that, that chance every single day with that pen to write the story of our lives. And during trials, it's hard. And sometimes you just have to say, okay, this just sucks and be okay with this being crappy and, and be okay with a difficult situation that you're living in. But eventually it will get better. It always does. And that is what has helped me the most. Mm -hmm. So for someone that you're working with or speaking to who can't see that light, they're just in such a dark place. And how do you instill hope in them? Um, where they hear your words, but they just can't, they just can't accept them. Yeah. And, and there's going to be people like that. I have learned in all of my work and my research that you cannot change another human being. You can, they have to change themselves. Uh, but we can influence and we can love and we can support and we can show kindness and we can help connect. But only if that person is, is willing and if they're ready. And sometimes they're not ready and that's okay. And sometimes you're just lost and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I've had great people in my life that have, you know, not tried to fix it, right? They've not tried to uh, come in and say, hey, this is what you need to do to get better. Hey, you should start, uh, you know, working out more. You should eat right, you know, get, get, get a lot of sleep. You should go and hang out with people, you know, make connections. The people that have really been the, the most meaningful in my life have been the people that have just said, hey, listen, what you're going through is really difficult and I'm here. Whenever you need anything, I'm here, let me know. Mm -hmm. And they check in, how, how, how are things? And, they, and they, don't, they don't look at the crisis. They don't look at the, the crisis, they look at the person. If they were friends and we used to talk about movies and we talk about life or we talk about, we talked about that. We didn't talk about the crisis. And that was a beautiful thing that I think eventually helped me to get through difficult times. Mm -hmm. So you're a man of many hats. Um, you're an author, comedian, speaker, musician, father, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel one really great question to ask people um, to get to uh, kind of an overview of who they are is their mission. All companies, all corporations, they have missions that serve as their guiding stars. 
Um, we as individuals ought to be cognizant of ours. Um, and it's something that's always changing. But right here, right now, what is your mission on this earth as a professional, as a father, as a musician, the mission that overarches amongst all your roles? Great question. And it is this, it is not about being the best in the world. It's about being the best for the world. That is what I live my life around. It is the difference between success versus significance. And I want to live a significant life, not just a, a successful life. You know, a lot of people, they look, oh, you're a drummer, you're an author, you, 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 you won an Emmy award, you're, you have all these accolades. But to me, at the end of the day, I want to be remembered as someone who was the best for other people. I was the best dad for my kids. I was the best friend for others. And, and you know, if, you, if, you, if I were to ask you, Derek, uh, you know, could you tell me who the last three NFL MVPs were? No. No clue, right? Or who were the last <laughs> two uh, uh, Miss, Miss Universes or no. Miss Americas, right? Uh, what about the last two Academy Award winners for best actor? No. You know who those people are? No, no. <laughs> no. But yet, they are some of the most famous, popular, successful, beautiful, elegant, wealthy people on the planet. Nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows. And I'm not saying anything against you know football or pageants or acting. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying there is a difference between success and significance. Because, for example, Derek, if I were to ask you to tell me the name of a teacher in your life that made a big difference for you. Mm -hmm. you. Do you remember their name? Yeah. What's their name? Um, Mr. Selby it was one. There's been many. Um, oh. I can't single out one. Yeah, but right, you know who they are. Or yeah. if I were to ask, you know, you tell me somebody at your workplace who's made your life a better story. Like we instantly know who those people are. Why? because they were significant in our lives. They were the people that got to the part about us. They were the people that were the best for you, not, not for themselves. It's the difference between success and significance. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. Right on. So this podcast is called Welcome to the Winner Circle because it's in my belief that anyone could be a winner. And winning to me is embracing the process. Um, we live in a very destination oriented society. When I get this job, when I get this relationship, when I get this award, when I get this, whatever degree, I'll be happy. And then we get, we get there and it's, you're maybe happy for a little bit. Then it's like, now what? Because we're missing the journey. We're missing the sweetness on the path. And to be a winner to me is by setting your sight on a destination and then moving forth in that direction, however small. Um, but saying yes to that in some way. And when we say yes to that progress, doors will open where otherwise would never have been there. What does winning mean to you? And what does going for your win look like to you in your life today? I think there's power in designing the life that you want to live. Um, intention and the power of being obsessive about the details. I have a, I have a, a little weird uh, story. I, I don't really share this a lot. Can we go on a tangent here for a minute, Derek, and try for something? Sure. Okay, so yeah. this is a little bit crazy. I, I don't tell many people this, because it's a little weird, but I love the movie E.T. Have you ever seen the movie E.T.? Yeah. Yeah, so a little, little alien, Steven Spielberg directed the film. Uh, I love that movie. I think it's one of the most iconic films ever made. You look at the, the, the cinematography, the lighting, the music, the scripting, uh, the storytelling, the acting, every combination of really what makes a great story, I, I, I see it in that film. When E.T. released, it knocked Star Wars out of the box office. It remained the number one movie in America for 11 years straight. Number one film. It grossed over $6 billion in just merchandising. Like people buying E.T. dolls, <laughs> like, like little plush toys and, and E.T. stuff. 
and it's 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 so crazy because it is the most simple story but it is beautifully iconic and there is a reason behind that the gentleman's name who created et his name is carlo rambaldi and he was a creature creator and steven spielberg went to him and he said this is this is the idea this is what i want to do and he got absolutely obsessive about the details he went through 300 iterations of E.T. and what E.T. would look like and what E.T. would feel like and what E.T. could be like. And he designed, honestly, one of the most iconic characters in cinematic history. E.T. is not real. But when you watch E.T. on that film, it is as real as any other human being in that scene because of the detail. He designed the creature. He got obsessive about the details and in doing so, created an iconic piece that is timeless, that is, that is truly beautiful. So the point I'm saying is I think that in life to win or to create a winning opportunity, you must design the ET. When they create a creature, and I really kind of <laughs> dived into this, it's a little weird, but I think creature creation is, a, is really a cool process because it translates to business, it translates to relationships, it translates to goals and objectives and things that we're trying to accomplish. It's kind of the same fundamental piece. They start out with the, the concept. Like, what's the idea? What is it that you want to you start with? Is it, I, I want to graduate with no debt in college. I, I want to find somebody to marry. I want to uh, get the promotion at the job. I want what, whatever it is. Like, what's the idea? And then they start with the illustration design. They literally write it out. A lot of people have goals. A lot of people have dreams, but they do not take the time to design the details. I'm talking every little thing that will help add up little by little that makes a little a lot towards the concept becoming a reality. So design it literally write it out. When I've created my website, I draw it out. When I created my book, I drew the cover. This is what I wanted it to feel like. This was the dimensions. This was the size. I wanted the paper to feel like this. I got obsessive about those details and it helped me to create something that was beautiful. And then after that, they go to sculpting. They actually will sculpt a maquette. So you call it like, you know, it's the, it's the beta test. It's, this is what I think it's going to look like. This is how it's going to feel. This is like the thing. And then they, they, they build the, the mechanics. Like, how are the hands going to work? It's one thing to have a website, but who's, who's going to host it? Who's going to design it? How is it going to function? Is it going to be easy for the user to use? They think through that whole process. Then they put the, the fabrication over and, uh, and then they, they create magic. And so my point is, again, design it design it. If you want to win, design the win. Take the time to get obsessive about the details. Create the ET. And if you do it right, you'll create something that's iconic. Mm -hmm. And how do you personally create space to listen to that win? Um, because it's something that we have to cultivate awareness of. How do you get quiet and listen to that source of creation that that inspires you as an author, musician, father? How do you listen to that inner voice, that yeah. inner calling? Yeah, it is. So one thing in our research of the 10,000 employees that we have interviewed undercover, when I found an employee that found purpose, an employee that was fired up, an employee that was really winning, the number one reason that they found purpose in their lives was through the association and connection with other purposeful people. So how do I find direction? How do I find you know, uh, that inner calling? A lot of it has come through other people. It's true, right? Jim Rohn, I don't know if you're familiar with Jim Rohn, Derek, but he mm -hmm. always said he'd become the average of the five people that you associate with most. I don't know if that's ever been proven, but I do believe that. Mm -hmm. If you put a hard to catch horse in a field with an easy to catch horse, usually end up with two hard to catch horses, right? You put a sick mm -hmm. child in the room with a healthy child, you're gonna end up with two sick kids. So for me, I've always, I'm always trying to take an inventory, a self audit in my mind of who am I hanging with? Who am I mm -hmm. listening to? Mm -hmm. You know, who am I following on Instagram? What am, what, am I, what am I surrounding my mind and my body with 
And is that influencing me for good? Because who you associate with determines what kind of life and what you see and what's possible or what's not possible based off of your perception. Yeah. But even then, even then, um, if we surround ourselves with people that uplift us, that inspire us, sometimes, or not even sometimes, often people become paralyzed because of fear. They're fearful of quitting that job to pursue that passion for drumming, or they're fearful of moving countries to pursue their adventure because that is the unknown world. And us as humans are, I believe, uh, are conditioned to this, like stay in the safe, known, comfortable world. And sometimes stepping out into that must should keep people in their place. So can you recall a time where you were paralyzed by fear? You knew you had to create something. You knew you had to take a chance and you were paralyzed and you were unable to do it. And then how did you overcome that? Yeah. So in college, I had another mentor and he shared with me a quote by Oscar Wilde. And the quote says, to live is the rarest thing in the world. For most people just exist. And that is all. Think about that for a minute. To live, like to really actually live a life worth living is the rarest thing in the world. Because most people just exist. They do the same thing every day, nine to five, rinse and repeat. I'm working for the benefits. I'm working for the, uh, I've got to pay the bills and uh, it's not what I love, but it's a job. And I, I get the weekends off and I can go do what I want and when I want and hopefully I don't get fired and I just keep doing what I'm doing. I have a job. They're existing. And I have been in that position before. Uh, when I was in college, I graduated and I chased the money. I was like, you got to get the benefits, right? You, you, if you want to live as a responsible human being, you've got to have some security because anything can happen, right? And if you want to have a family and like you need to function as a responsible human being. So I chased the money and I went into the medical field. I became an orthopedic consultant. I was making great money. I had paid for a car in cash, uh, had a, a beautiful home. Uh, I was newly married. But every day, I was just existing. Every day. And everybody has kind of like tagged Mark Twain with this quote. I don't know if it was actually Mark Twain. There's a lot of controversy around it, but I do love the quote. And the quote is, there's two important days in a person's life. The day you're born and then the day you figure out why. And that quote resonated with me along with the other quote. And I was not born. I was not put here on this earth in my mind to be doing what I was doing. And out of desperation, I sat down with two friends and I said to my, to my buddies, great friends, great, 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 great colleagues. And I said, you guys, wouldn't it be crazy if you could find one job that allowed you to do three things in life? And they said, well, what are the three things? And I said, passion, purpose, and the ability to provide in a way that was sufficient for you. What if you could find one job that allowed you to do all three? And both of my friends said, mm, doesn't happen. They said, ah, it's rare. It's rare, man. Like, look at a teacher. You know, they're, they're teaching. They're full of passion and purpose. But every summer, they're looking for another job so they can pay the bills. Or look at the doctor. You know, doctors making lots of money. They've got the, the provide part down. But passion and purpose are stressed all the time. They're, they, they, you know, they're running through the motions. They get sued all the time, all the dictation, all the notes. They're never home with their family. Like, they're like, I don't think you can find a job that allows you to do one thing. And then my buddy said, it's rare. That's so rare. It's an anomaly. And then it, it triggered that quote by Oscar Wilde, to live is the rarest thing in the world. I was so tired of existing, Derek, that two weeks after that conversation, I quit my job and I burned the ships. I literally, I quit everything. I walked away and I jumped into the world that I am now in. And the day I quit my job was the day I truly started living. And it was in the pursuit of those three Ps, passion, purpose, and the ability to provide. 
And then everybody asks, well, how'd you do it? I created the ET. I designed it. I got obsessive about the details. And then I also created a board of mentors. Who are the people that were living and breathing the life that I wanted to live? And I think that we should do whatever it takes to associate with those astonishing people because that's how we find that connection. It's scary. It's so scary to jump into a world that you have no clue what you're doing, but you de-risk the situation. If you can de-risk a situation, you set yourself up to succeed. You associate with people that have done it. You learn from their failures. You learn from their successes. You, you hang out by the hoop. I've always said that. If you want to play basketball, go hang out by the hoop. If you want to jump in and become an entrepreneur, where are the entrepreneurs hanging out? What social groups, Facebook, chats, magazines, books, things that you can educate yourself in. We've all heard that story. You've heard the story, right, Derek, of burning the ships. Cortez burns the ships. And he mm -hmm. tells the men, you're either going to win or you're all going to die because I just burnt the ships. And for me, I've always heard that story. And I thought, well, how close can I bring the ship into shore before I burn it? De-risk the situation. And when it comes time to jump, you'll have more courage. You'll have more faith. You'll have more of an educated hypothesis, not just a wandering hopefulness. Mm -hmm. And when you jumped, when you said yes, and you quit your job, what were the, some of the challenges you face it, faced, the failures you may have encountered, and the learning opportunities you took away from them? Oh, man. Uh, I mean, the challenges were, first off, how am I going to survive? <laughs> how am I going to pay the bills, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we looked at the budget. That was a big thing. Because I said, okay, I just quit my job. Money, money's, money's, money's no more. So how much do I have in savings? How much am I spending every month? And then how much do I need to bring in to compensate for that? That was, that was super scary. It was also, I announced it to the world. On, on I, Facebook, my family, my friends, and I just, a big post, and I said, today I quit my job. And I kind of told a little bit of the story, and this is what I want to do. And so there was the pressure of, you know, I now made it public. It wasn't just a private endeavor. This was announced to the world. So that was scary. I had a lot of people watching. And there were a lot of people that wanted me to see succeed, but there's a lot of people watching saying, I did have people message me and they're like, dude, are you okay? Like, are you sure? Because I had a really great job. In the world's eye, what I was doing was very successful, but it wasn't significant for me. Um, and then I think there's the, always just the pressure of, again, not knowing how it's all going to work, not knowing if it will be received. How, how do I... How do I pivot? How do I make, you know, I was, I was going into the business world. So in the business world, you've got to make something that's marketable, something that the market deems valuable. And if you don't, then you just have a really, you have an idea, but it's not marketable. So there was the fear of, you know, the market. Am I going to actually be able to market myself? I am the product as a professional speaker. Uh, so there's all of that, all of those stress, all of the pressures. And then, and then obviously too, my family, how am I going to keep, keep uh, house over the people that I promised I would take care of forever. All those things, man. All, and it's still there. That's the entrepreneur life. You know, we work 80 hours a week, so we don't have to work 40. And uh, yeah, it's just a part of it. Mm -hmm. So you talked about in your book, what um, made people want to stay at their companies and leadership and mentorship were two of the examples. What are some of the things that people made people not want to stay at their company that made people despise their jobs? Yeah. Again, management, coming back to management, there's always four types of managers in every company. There's the removed manager, the buddy manager, the controlling manager, and then the mentor manager. And the removed manager is someone that's just burnt out and people got disengaged because leadership got disengaged. Or there's the controlling manager. This is the manager that was constantly just so hard on everybody. The command and control style of management coming down on people and do your job. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm not here to be your friend. I give you a paycheck. Do your job. Like that, that weighs on people. And the fear-based tactics of every day coming into work and, and just having no idea what's going to happen wrong today. It wears on people. Um, 
two things always, obviously, and every time when an employee left a job, it was because they couldn't survive at the job. So the job didn't pay enough. They couldn't keep food on the table. They were living paycheck to paycheck. They could never get ahead. They could not survive. And then the second thing is thrive. They couldn't thrive. Like they didn't feel the passion. They didn't feel purpose. They didn't feel a sense of belonging. So Mm -hmm. I'm out. It's interesting. Um, Let's talk about the lens. So I could be looking at the same manager as you are looking at. And the story that I have created and learned about authority figures may change my perception of that leader. So that leader may, in fact, be a great mentor, a great leader, but I'm not able to see that or hear that because I'm coming into that situation. Oh, that that is my boss and a boss means this. And people are looking for someone adversarial to kind of put in that role of the villain. Yes. Um, So. Yeah. So what have you learned about that and how can we dismantle those roles that we've created from the myths and the stories we we've heard as children and experience as children and that become our reality? I think it's, it's how the story unfolds. It's the beauty of both people being willing to make something happen, make being willing to make something work. Uh, and it's not just management. It's also the employees. And if you're not willing to give somebody a chance, if you're not willing to hear somebody, if you're not willing to stay open, how do you expect others to do the same for you, right? You will skew that perception. And and, and that's where, again, you have those dysfunctional situations and relationships at work. And that's where employees get fired. Employees get let go. Or Mm -hmm. where you have a manager that says, I need to coach you out because it's not working. It's not, we're not connecting. And if the managers tried, great. If the employees tried, great. But if there's still that disconnect, here's the thing. It's all situational. So to come in and say, like, this is the thing, or this is what you would do, or this is the recommendation, it always depends on the person. It depends on the situation. It depends on the manager. It depends on the employee. But there are universal truths that when it happened for both people, it was a beautiful thing. And it was usually because of certain factors that allowed that connection to take place. Mm-hmm. And those universal truths. Yeah. So what stand- are they? Yeah, standards and connection. So, as a manager, you have a job that needs to be done, right? You have a product that needs to be so you need to sell a profit. You're in business, but there's also the other side that is connection. The willingness to understand that people are people. People have a life outside of work. Standards and connection. Uh, when we create that for the our employees in a way that works for them, right? Because every employee is asking the question, let me know when it gets to the part about me. That's why mentorship is so key. It's not a title. Mentorship is earned. It's earned through an employee, not not by what a manager does. It's because of who Mm -hmm. the mentor was. And so that's a universal truth. Any mentor that becomes a great mentor, they were high on standards because that connected somebody to their dreams, but they were also equally high on their connection. They got Mm -hmm. to the part about that person. Mm -hmm. So through it all, through your entire hero's journey, beyond um, the undercover millennial, uh, beyond the book, just looking back on your entire hero's journey, what has been your greatest life lesson that you've learned thus far and that speaks to you right now that you want to share with our listeners? Man, that's a hard question. I would say just the beauty of, 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 creating an environment where people don't just like their job, but they actually like who they are while they're at that job. That Mm -hmm. was a beautiful thing. And I think we need more of that. Uh, We need a workplace where, again, people aren't just surviving, they're thriving. They're actually living. We spend a lot of time at work. And when we can create that environment where people like who they are, and they experience themselves best because of what great leaders do, what great colleagues do, And they're a part of an organization that's full of passion that sparks their heart on fire, but they also have the opportunity to do something bigger than themselves. That, that would be it. Mm -hmm. And through it all, what have you learned about love? What does that word love mean to you? Work. (laughs) Love takes work. Uh, 
um, love love uh, is something that takes consistency to keep it. It might it might happen fairly fast, right? I fell in love. It was a it was love at first sight, but love requires work to maintain that flame mm-hmm. in anything. Mm-hmm. To close every episode, I ask each guest uh, final two questions, and we come to that point. So my first question to you, in three words, how would you describe the experience you are having on this earth? Significant, fulfilled, and hopeful. Significant, fulfilled, and hopeful. Beautiful. And the final question, I believe we are all magicians, and we have the power to transform reality, starting with our own. And I'm going to transform our collective reality. And I'm going to bring us into the future. I'm going to bring us into the future. And we're going to be alongside an 85-year-old Clint Pulver. What is the life that that 85-year-old Clint is living? What is the impact that you've left on this world? Yeah, the, the impact would be that I hope people like themselves best uh, because of me. That they were able to live a better story because of me. I want to be the 85-year-old mentor, the Mr. Jensen in people's lives. Mm-hmm. And what does your life look like? Who, who are you surrounded by? Where are you? What is going on in your life? What are you doing? I'm still writing. I'm still speaking. I would be doing the exact same thing that I'm doing right now. I would be with my family. I would be very involved in their lives. I would be still spreading my message. I would still be following my heart, uh, doing the things that serve other people, and then obviously uh, providing. I'd be doing the three Ps. I'd be living. I would still be living. That's what that would look like. Mm -hmm. And where in the world would you be? Alpine, Utah. Perfect. So I want you to picture where, where in Utah, like what would your house look like? Yeah, we have. Like uh, where would, what would you be surrounded by? I want you to really visualize this 85-year-old Clint. Yeah, yeah, we have the land. I know exactly where the land is. It's up in this beautiful cove up in the mountains. And we already know we have a, a, a picture board of what our house looks like. And we know exactly where it's going to sit. And uh, uh, we know kind of where we want as far as uh, our family and, and how, many, how many kiddos. And, um, but yeah, that's where we're going to be. That's, that's our spot. Mm-hmm. So I want you to be in this moment with this 85-year-old Clint. So I'm not going to leave us there in the future. I'm going to bring us back into the now because the now is all we have. And in the now, that 85-year-old Clint, he sends you a message. What does he whisper in your ear? He whispers in my ear, well done. You lived a life of significance. You really lived. Well done. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Um, your book comes out. I love it here. It comes out on April 13th. That's released nationally. Um, where else can people that are interested in learning more about you can find you? Yeah, they can, uh, they can find the book on Amazon and then they can find more about me at clintpulver.com. Beautiful. And any last words of wisdom for the audience that, that you didn't have a chance to speak? No, I appreciate that. This has been an honor for me. Uh, One maybe last quick thought is we found that good leaders for the most part knew what they needed to do, but the great leaders knew what they needed to stop doing. And most people in your life spell connection T-I-M-E. Granted, they can't spell that well, but that's how they spell it. Mm -hmm. What are the things in your life that you can stop doing right now that would allow you to connect more? That would be my end thought. Right on. And to close every episode, we bring our fists together for digital fist bump because we could all join the winner circle. Boom. Thank you so much. Um, I wish you a beautiful day and a successful launch with your new book. I appreciate it, Derek. Thank you. Thank you.